all of you who feel dry and thirsty, come to the water. Fill your hands, splash your face, drink deeply. Let it run down your chin. Living water, we give thanks for springs of water and deep wells, for the streams and rivers of our watershed, for the rains that fall. We give thanks for water that sustains our life. We give thanks for water that washes and cleanses, for water that refreshes and restores. We give thanks for water that renews our life. We give thanks for your love and mercy pouring into our lives, soaking into our parched places, filling us up to the brim, overflowing in us to be a blessing for all. Come. To the water of life. Good morning and welcome to St. Jacob's Mennonite Church from wherever you are watching and whenever you are watching. A special welcome also to those from the many Mennonite Church congregations across Canada tuning in for Mennonite Church Canada's National Worship Service. This morning, our congregation begins a summer worship series called Come to the Water. Over the course of the summer, we will be paying attention to the significance of water, both in the many diverse stories of water found throughout Scripture, as well as in the very particular stories of our own lives. Water appears at many places in the biblical story, beginning with Genesis, when the Spirit of God hovers over the primordial waters of creation, and proceeding all the way to the book of Revelation, with John's vision of the river of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. More than just a minor background detail, Water is often an essential element to the scriptural stories, shaping and giving contour to God's relationship with creation as a whole and God's people in particular. As we experience these stories of water throughout scripture, we will also discover that these appearances of water throughout scripture give us a window into our own relationship with water. At a basic level, we all know that we cannot live without water and that it is such an important part of God's good creation. When we come to the water throughout this summer series, however, <clears throat> we will be invited to consider more deeply what our relationship to water looks like. Do we take it for granted? Do we forget its importance not only as a life-giving element of our physical lives, but as a crucial part of the whole of creation. Is our relationship to water living into God's intention for the flourishing of creation? Whether we recognize it or not, we shape the waters of our world, and in turn, our lives are shaped by water. As we come to the water, we will be invited to reflect on those times that our relationship to very particular bodies of water have shaped us. 
One concrete way we'll try to practice this reflection throughout the summer will be through the inclusion of occasional short water stories told by members of the congregation. These water stories will provide opportunities for members of SJMC to share stories of specific bodies of water that have had or continue to have an impact on their own lives. Today, we will not have a particular water story shared, but in place of that, I invite you now to take a moment and consider the bodies of water you are located by and their importance in shaping the land you live on. One specific body of water that has shaped and continues to shape the lives of many of us at St. Jacob's Mennonite Church is the Grand River. Not only has the Grand River shaped the lives of many of our members, especially through the watershed that provides such rich land for farming, but long before Mennonite settlers made their homes along the Grand River, it has been and continues today to be an important and sacred part of the lives of many First Nations peoples. In just a moment, Wendy Jansen, who is currently working in the Indigenous Neighbours Program at MCC, will lead us in a land acknowledgement that helps to situate us along the Grand River. This video was first used as part of the Interfaith Grand River Community Breakfast in May. As a way of preparing ourselves to acknowledge our place along the Grand River with Wendy, I invite you to join me in a prayer adapted from an Ojibwe Six Directions prayer, which is included in Voices Together number 864. The prayer was adapted by Barb Daniels and Neil von Gunten in 2002 for the Riverton Fellowship Circle in Riverton, Manitoba, a small town located along Lake Winnipeg and, incidentally, also located near the farm where my wife Melody grew up. While praying, I invite you to stand if you are able and face the different directions. The text of the prayer will appear on the screen. I will speak the leader parts, and I invite you to speak the parts labeled all. We offer thanksgiving to our Creator, recalling that Christ is the center of creation and our lives as Christians. As we face east, the direction of the rising sun, we offer thanks for the gifts of the tree world and for new beginnings. Help us to be honest with you and others and to be wise and just in our use of the resources of the earth. We give thanks to you, O God. As we face south, where we receive warmth, we offer thanks for the gifts of the animal world and for the call to be humble. Enable us to walk good paths, to live as families should, and with you to renew the face of the earth. We give thanks to you, O God. As we face west, where we receive teachings of faith, we offer thanks for the gifts of the rock world and the purifying and fruitful waters. Sustain us and the earth through your Holy Spirit and give us faith as strong as the rock we give thanks to you, O God. As we face north, the direction of wind and snow, we offer thanks for the plant world and for kindness and wisdom. Breathe your strength and endurance into us and give us wisdom to treat each other with kindness. We give thanks to you, O God. as we face center. From above comes the unconditional love of God. From the earth comes the gift of life. 
we give thanks for the love like the wings of the eagle. We dedicate our lives to you, our creator and savior. As we walk on this earth, may we learn together and celebrate the way of peace, harmony, and tranquility. We give thanks to you, O God. Amen. I'd like to recognize that this watershed, which is our common home, which is our source of life, which is where I think many of us, if not all of us, live and work and worship. But this is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. From time immemorial, they have called this place home and they've seen it as sacred. This river marks the center of the Haldeman Tract, a proclamation that promised the land on six miles on either side of this river from its source to its mouth to the people of Six Nations and their descendants. I recognize that treaties have not been kept to their full intent and that there have been very harmful effects of colonialism, both on the land and on Indigenous peoples both in the past and carrying on until today. And it's my prayer that as settlers and as people of faith, that we will do our work to redress past wrongs, that we will work towards building relationships and building bridges, and that we will dance our way together towards reconciliation. Good morning. You are listening to 1308 King FM. And today on our radio show, we have a couple of guests from Waterloo, Ontario, joining us to talk about water. Brothers Micah and Jaron Clausen are here this morning. Welcome, Jaron and Micah. How are you doing today? Good. Pretty good. Well, thanks for being here today. 
When I spoke to you in advance to ask you to come on the show and to let you know that St. Jacob's Mennonite Church would be having a summer worship series based around the theme, Come to the Water, I was pleased that you accepted the invitation. No problem. It was fun. I was equally excited that you were willing to provide some creative illustrations to go along with our interview to help our online viewers get a better sense for the topic that we are discussing today. It was fun. Awesome. Okay, well, why don't we jump right in? I was wondering if both of you would be willing to share with me today a bit about what comes to mind when you think of water. What are some of the first things that you think about when you think about water? A water park or water slide. Oh, yes. Okay, water parks. And we've gone to water parks before, haven't we, uh, in the States? And those are a lot of fun. A lot of water you need there to make the slide slippery to go down. It's a good time, right? Yep. Sweet. What about you, Jaren? Uh, I'm thinking about cliff jumping, which we were going to do in our upcoming camping trip to Kill Bear. Oh, yeah, cliff jumping. You got to be uh, careful with that one, but you definitely need some good deep water to uh, jump into for that, right? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, those are great responses. Now, I happen to have the inside scoop that both of you have many great experiences with particular bodies of water, places that you've really enjoyed being in the water, perhaps. Do you mind sharing some of those? Micah, why don't you go first? Um, probably Riverstone and some water parks that we've been to as well. Yep. Okay, so Riverstone, that's the retreat center we've uh, gone church camping with, right? With St. Jacob's? Yep. Yeah, that's great. That's on the Salgeen River there that, that runs runs through the camp, uh, camp there. That's a great place. What about you, Jaren? I definitely think of when we went to North Carolina and we had a beach house with some friends by the North Atlantic Ocean. That yeah. was fun. Yeah, that was a great time. Oh, those are some really, uh, really great uh, memories you have. And I can see that there's a little bit of a, a swimming theme for sure. That's great. All right, I've asked you a bit about your own experiences with water, but I have a little bit of a different question to ask you now. When you think about water, what kind of stories from the Bible come to your mind? Micah. Um, maybe when Moses made the sea part and let everybody get past. And then when the enemies came, the water sploshed back down and they never got to them. Right. Okay. So the story in Exodus with the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, right? That's a good one. Jaren, what about you? Uh, I think of Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the sea monster uh, because that definitely has something to do with water. Uh -huh. Those are some really great stories from the Bible. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, yeah, there are actually so many more stories from the Bible that have to do with water. And if you pay attention to the services at uh, SJMC over the summer, you're going to learn a l about a lot of different stories in the Bible that involve specific bodies of water. You looking forward to that? Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. It's going to be awesome. Cool. Well, Jaren and Micah, thanks for joining us today and sharing your thoughts on water. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. You have been listening to 1308 King FM. Goodbye for now.
come to the water, and as we listen to its sound, we hear the tide long before human beings ever were. Genesis one, one to two. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. We come to the ocean, seas, and rivers, and see that water is God's gift and blessing, a home to many creatures. Genesis chapter one, verses twenty to twenty-two. And God said, "Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures." So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, of every kind, with which the waters swarm. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, "Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas." We come to an ancient river, and as we look down at our own shimmering reflection, we remember a time when God created human beings. And place them in the garden, watered by that river. Genesis chapter two, verses eight to ten. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there He put the human whom He had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. A river flows out of Eden. To water the garden. We come to the sea of rain, and we remember stories from long ago of oppressed Israel fleeing Egyptian for a life of freedom. Exodus chapter fourteen, verses twenty-one to twenty-nine. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground. The waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Come to the river Jordan and watch as the Israelites prepare to enter a land of promise. Joshua chapter one verses one to two. The Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, "My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites." We come to the rivers of Babylon, and we see the plight of Israel in exile. Psalm one thirty-seven verses one to four. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked for song, and our tormentors asked us for mirth, saying, "Sing to us one of those songs of Zion." How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We come again to the river Jordan and hear the sounds of the Baptist. Matthew chapter three, verses two. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. At the same river, we see Jesus entering the water. Suddenly, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, "This is my Son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased." We come to the Sea of Galilee, and we see Jesus calling the sea. Matthew chapter four verses eighteen to twenty. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, "Follow me, and I will make you fish for people." Immediately they left their nets and followed him. We come to Jacob's well, and we find Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman about a new kind of water. John chapter four, verses thirteen to fourteen. Jesus said to her, "Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them 
a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. We come to the Mediterranean Sea and find Paul still in the ready to speak the good news. Acts chapter 13, verses 13 to 14. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and in Pamphylia. They went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went on into the synagogue and sat down. We come to the end and find it is a new beginning. We hear of a vision of an orchard in a city watered by a river that comes from God, giving life to all. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, white as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. On the other side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. We come to the water, Amy. Good morning. It is so good to be preaching at St. Jacob's Mennonite as part of this MC Canada nationwide worship service. I am part of the pastoral team here, together with newly hired Janet Bauman and Liz Weber, who is covering right now for Kevin Dirksen's sabbatical. And I bring you warm greetings from our congregation. I think about how the peoplehood and community of MC Canada has run through my life. I grew up and was shaped in faith and baptized at First Mennonite Church in Edmonton. Not only my pastor father and theologian mother, but much of my broader family were conference junkies. And since very young, I have been to more Mennonite conferences and assemblies than I can count. Camp Velacqua in Alberta was a key place of formation and testing leadership gifts as a youth. But I somehow managed to also get to Camp Squia in BC, Camp Shekina in Saskatchewan, and Moose Lake Camp in Manitoba. And my kids have drank the water deeply at Silver Lake Mennonite Camp here in Ontario. Then there is studying at what was then Canadian Mennonite Bible College, CNBC, now CMU in Winnipeg, Conrad Grable, and crossing the border to AMBS Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana and two significant shaping young adult years with Mennonite Voluntary Service at Welcome In Community Centre and Church in Hamilton, Ontario. Throw in some MCC learning trips and Mennonite World Conference experiences in there and you can see what I have been steeped in. I think about all the diversity and richness and gifts of all these relationships and how this has made me who I am, shaped and formed my identity. This stuff gets into your blood. It runs through you. Some of you may remember the 1992 movie, A River Runs Through It, directed by Robert Redford and winning the Academy Award for Best Cinematography. I watched some YouTube clips this week to remind me again of this beautiful, stunning, and profound movie. It is based on the 1976 autobiographical novella by Norman MacLean, and it follows the story of two very different brothers, Paul and Norman, growing up in the 1920s under the stern and stoic watch of Presbyterian minister John MacLean along the big Blackfoot River in Montana. The first sentence in our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. Life is simple until it gets complex, and Paul and Norman take very different life directions, clashing when Norman returns home after six years of college, all the way along trying to sort through their inner struggles, their identity, their values, and what this religious context has gifted and cursed them with. What they can do and do together with their father is go fly fishing with all its charm, grace, and precision. In the fishing along this wild rushing river, there is a, a peace, 
a sorting through and coming to terms with one's own life journey. Fly fishing becomes a metaphor. The late movie critic Robert Ebert writes, fly fishing stands for life in this movie. If you can learn to do it correctly, to read the river and the fish and yourself, and do what needs to be done without one wasted motion, you will have attained some of the grace and economy needed to live a good life. If you can do it and understand that the river, the fish, and the whole world are God's gifts to use wisely, you will have gone the rest of the, of the way. Like these movie characters, we all live within a certain context, within the streams that have become a part of our lives. We can only see the part of the river we are navigating, and it brings us its gifts and its challenges as it flows by, as we sort through our identity and purpose in light of what we have been given. You never step into the same river twice, the same water. As the father preaches near the end of his life, still grieving the untimely death of son Paul, we can love completely without completely understanding. The movie ends with the original words of Norman MacLean from his novella. Of course, now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman, and now I usually fish the big waters alone, although some friends think I shouldn't. But when I'm alone in the half-light of the canyon, all existence seems to fade to a, to a being with my soul and memories, and the sounds of the big Blackfoot River and the four-count rhythm, and a hope that a fish will rise. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's greatest flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. It is this movie that jumped to my mind when we started planning for our summer worship theme here at St. Jacob's Mennonite, Come to the Water. As Zach shared, we are diving into the waters of both our lives and the scriptures. Water is all around us and essential to life. Yet so often we take it for granted or fail to pay attention to its life-giving gifts. We turn on the tap and use almost frivolously without remembering the water's long journey from a water source, a river, a lake, groundwater, to treatment plants, infrastructure, pipes, and a whole circle and cycle of life that gave us this gift. Something not to be taken for granted in so much of our world including so many of our own First Nation communities here in Canada. Most of our communities, our towns and villages and cities, are situated along water, a lake, an ocean, or more, most often a river. And it makes sense. This is where life can happen. We need that water source. Growing up in Edmonton, it was the North Saskatchewan River that gave shape to the whole city. In Winnipeg, it is the Red River and the Cinnaboy River, meeting as they do at the Forks. In Toronto, Lake Ontario. In St. Jacobs, it is the Conestogo River, feeding into the Grand River. There is a reason we live along rivers and waters. We need it for survival, for life itself. Waters run through the scriptures too. We heard some of that in the Reader's Theater, that sweep of scripture from the wind of God and creation sweeping over the face of the waters to the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God. All the great themes of the Bible are connected to water, the waters of creation, redemption and deliverance in crossing the Red Sea through the exodus from Egypt, the passing over the Jordan into the promised land, and both the promise and temptation that produces. Spirituality, our intimate connection to God, especially in the Psalms, my soul thirsts for thee, like trees planted by streams of water. 
God leads me beside still waters. Even after the darkest valleys, my cup runneth over. There is the call of the prophets to right living. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We find our deepest and most meaningful ritual in the waters of baptism, seen already with Jesus in the Jordan. With you I am well pleased. And the disciples are called to ministry from the sea, from their fishing. And it's living water offered to all that will become a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, salvation itself. But there are also individual stories that gain meaning when we pay attention to the waters within them. Jonah and the whale, the healing of Naaman in the river, Elijah calling down fire on a drenched sacrifice leading to the first rains after a time of drought, Jesus walking on the water and Peter trying to follow suit, Jesus calming the storm, catching fish on the other side of the lake, preparing for a, a beach lunch, Paul's shipwreck at sea, and more. There is more than a summer's worth of water stories here, but each one begs the question of what happens when we pay attention to the water itself in the story. What might we learn? What might be revealed? Throughout scriptures, there is this, this interplay between the universal, the big themes, and the very particular, the lives that we find ourselves in. Waters can be cleansing. Waters can be life-giving. Waters can be dangerous and a threat. Waters can help us recognize the outsider. Waters can convict us of truth and reveal our innermost vulnerabilities. Waters can clarify our identity and sharpen our deepest commitments. And yes, sometimes the waters can haunt us, as McLean said. A river certainly runs through scripture and through our lives. I look forward to diving in this summer. Zach also shared that we will be having water stories most Sundays as part of the worship service. Congregational members sharing about particular bodies of water that have been significant for them, impacted them, and why. The question we have given several people for us to, to, to share on this summer is, Tell us about a particular body of water that is significant to you. What is meaningful about this body of water? And you could tell a story about it if you wish. How has this body of water fed your soul? These questions prompted me to think about the bodies of water in my life. And I could pick many from all my homes and travels and camping and canoeing. But during the last year, it has been the Grand River that has taken on a le level of significance and depth for me. And yes, I have lived in Kitchener for more than 25 years and known that the river was here, but I am not sure if I ever really paid attention to it. When the pandemic began, I found myself bereft of so many of my normal and loved weekend activities, church events and potlucks, choirs, sports, social gatherings, and so on. So one of the things I started to do with this weekend time was to bike more. And I found myself instinctively heading towards the trails along the Grand River, the Walter Bean Trail, and new sections each week, discovering where they all go and how they all connect up, sometimes leaving the river for neighborhoods, but always returning back to the river. So I discovered and biked all the trails from North Waterloo down through Kitchener, Cambridge, continuing to Paris and Brantford, and even the section to Hamilton on the bike path where it leaves the river. I've also canoed or kayaked several times in the areas of the river around here and looked at the banks from the river itself. So I've had both views. Last Saturday, as part of my preparation for this sermon, I kayaked the 30 kilometers from Conestoga to the Kitchener Freeport Bridge. And I have been amazed and grateful for how natural this region has kept the river. You can hardly tell you're within the city limits as you traverse the river. You, you might see a house or two peeking out here or there, but for the most part, it has been kept natural. And I'm grateful. The need for floodplain probably helped, 
but also good planning and protection, and I hope that continues. Now, there is a certain character to the Grand River. It is both uh, lazy and rugged, from calm waters to small rapids as it meanders and twists its way through Waterloo County and beyond. It is amazing how much the river circles and curves back on itself as it moves along. And if you pay attention, you start to notice all the willow trees and other vegetation. And you start to see the wildlife that depends on this water. The singing birds, the fish beneath the surface, small mammals, the many geese and ducks, the heron, the osprey, and even a few weeks ago, a giant bald eagle, a first for me locally. There are close to 250 species of birds, 90 species of fish, and roughly 80 species at risk in this Grand River watershed. I began to reflect on how this river provides life for me too, and for our cities and towns and rural communities for this particular 6,800 square kilometer watershed, the size of Prince Edward Island, that starts in the highlands of Dufferin County and empties 310 kilometers later into Lake Erie. It is home to one million people in five cities, 39 municipalities, and two First Nation territories, six nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Farms make up about 70% of the land, and the whole system is managed and kept flowing by a network of seven reservoirs and a number of dams. This river is a special place. The Grand River has become a spiritual place for me, a place where I go to reflect on life and on God and on our place and purpose in this world. I find my whole spirit slowing down as I bike along its banks or paddle its waters. I learn its lessons. You have to take time. Be patient. Life does not go in straight lines, but curves and twists its way along. You don't know what might be around the next bend. You need to pay attention to see life around you. You can hit rapids that might capsize you or shake up your presumptions. In low, mo in low moments, you can become grounded, immobilized, and need to get out and push yourself forward, find a new way. And you can take the time to have fun, to simply soak in God's creation. God has created the world good. There are so many lessons from this river. But I have also found the Grand River challenging me. Not that often, but I have found garbage along the way. Old tires beneath the water, pop cans floating along, sewers emptying their murky waters into a river, an abandoned industrial iron pulley system jutting across the river just south of Victoria Street. There is probably more that I do not see, but human consumption and waste and overindulgence have polluted our waters and air and land. And you see the, the invasive species. I saw a bunch of giant hogweed this last Saturday. Climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time and for the future of human life on this planet. It is sobering. It's a spiritual crisis too. And my time on the Grand brings it to focus for me, even as I look around so often at the river's beauty and life. Again, it's about paying attention. One of the things I love about the Grand River are the many tributaries and rivers that flow in and join the Grand. The Conestogo, just past St. Jacob's, the Speed River in Cambridge, which itself was fed by the Aramosa River near Guelph, and the Nith in Paris. And each time a river comes in, it shakes up the river system and brings a new diversity. A river is healthier as it takes in and mixes water from many sources. I began the sermon by sharing some of my very Mennonite rootedness, something that has been a gift. 
but it, it is the river that has run through me. But it mostly comes from one source, one stream. The real gift in the last years have been so many opportunities to drink from different streams of spirituality, of experience, of belief, of culture. I affirm the move towards an intercultural church and taking seriously the gifts that we all receive by being church together and the challenges that will bring about change, that will shake up assumptions and the way we do things, the way we do church. Here at St. Jacob's, our, our mutual partnerships and back and forth relationships with Grace Lyle Mennonite, with the Benin Bible Institute, with Burning Bush Forest Church, these long-term relationships are all so important to us as we listen and share and learn from each other. They help us see the world through different lenses. When different rivers meet and mix and join, there is some turmoil and the whole river may shift in a different direction but the river is stronger and healthier. In a few weeks, I will again be a part of an interior canoe trip with a group of MCEC intercultural pastors. I look forward to this trip and all our adventures. And it's as we live and learn together on the waters that our relationship and understanding of each other and God will grow and thrive. Each time I go to the Grand River, I am also very aware of its history and connections to the indigenous peoples that were here first. This river connects me. This river connects us. We live on the Haldeman Track, land promised for six miles on each side of the Grand River to the Six Nations in perpetuity. And in the last year, we have heard more of these stories through some of the MCEC Truth and Reconciliation Working Group Zoom calls including directly from some of the folks at the 1492 Lambach Lane dispute in Cayuga, where we have also brought some meals as a congregation. This week, eight, eight folks from Six Nations are canoeing large sections of the Grand to bring awareness to land development and justice issues along its banks. And these are complex issues. Last fall, the bike path took me right through Six Nations, very close to the Woodland Cultural Centre and Mohawk Residential School, where our youth had spent time two summers ago helping to save the evidence, retaining this residential school building as a reminder of the Canadian legacy and tragedy of the residential school system, and where, where they were privileged and trusted to hear some of those stories of survivors and begin some of those relationships. I have personally sat and listened to some of these residential school stories at the TRC hearings a few years ago in Thunder Bay around some of the Mennonite residential schools in northwestern Ontario and the larger TRC hearings in Toronto, going there together with my sister, intersecting with my own family history with her as part of the 60s scoop. In the last couple of weeks in Canada, we have been shaken by the news out of Kamloops of the 215 bodies of children found buried at that site, something that has been repeated across Canada. And I wonder, I wonder how this is all tied into the rivers and waters and how they were treated and divided and conquered rather than coming as guests and seeing this as a shared resource. How do we read our current situation back into the Bible just as the Bible reads us? What new questions do we need to ask as a community, as a church? How do we reread the story, reread the stories of a chosen people of God crossing the Jordan to enter the promised land, but dispossessing those who were already living there? What do we do with land ownership and power structures? and its impact on how water is used as a resource. Where do we need water in the desert? What does the promise of pouring water out on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground land mean in our current global setting facing climate change? What might living water mean for us today, for our personal lives, for our congregations? or for us to trust God in stormy seas. I, I, I hope we can have this kind of 
back and forth and questions with scripture this summer as we live with all these water scriptures and our own stories. These are the stories and wonderings I begin to have as I spend more and more time along the Grand River. What bodies of water have become significant to you? What biblical story of water captivates you and you want to learn and ask more questions? Where do the waters challenge you to re-examine your life? Where do the waters offer living streams that will quench your soul? Where do the waters call you to love completely even without completely understanding? What is the river that runs through your life? I invite you to listen to the hymn that follows, Voices Together, number 642, Healing River of the Spirit. This is a new hymn text by Ruth Duck with wonderful music by Sally Ann Morris. It captures the healing of the spirit that bathes the wounds that living brings and guides our winding human course together, flowing homeward to our source. The Bible. Our lives, our shared futures. A river runs through it. Amen. Hi, I'm Jim Krogert, and I'm glad to have my song, Here by the Water, included in the new Voices Together. A couple of things uh, to say about the song. One is that it alludes in, in some ways to a very dark night in my life when I uh, was really struggling, and I walked through a field to a place by the water and placed my life uh, in God's hands. And the other is uh, taking note of the times when uh, in the Old Testament there would be a crossing of a river or some significant uh, journey uh, and they would mark that place by uh, building an altar or, or out of the stones that were around there. And for me, that is also a, a metaphor for songwriting and working with what I have, putting things together, uh, 
and then putting them before God, knowing that God can make them holy. This is here by the water. Soft field of clover, moon shining over the valley, joining the song of the river to the great giver of the great good. As it enfolds me, somehow it holds me to. As we join together in prayer today, we acknowledge all the gifts that have been shared in this congregation for the work of God's kingdom here, in our neighborhoods, and around the world. Thanks be to God. 
And we also celebrate connections to our Mennonite Church Canada family of faith in all its wonderful diversity across this country. For the gifts of this diverse church community, we say, thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in a time of congregational prayer. Loving God, you who are the river of life flowing through all our lives, we give you thanks for life-giving water that reminds us of the goodness of your love poured into our lives. We give you thanks for the wetlands, streams, and rivers of the watersheds where we live and for the rains that nourish the land. Let your refreshing waters flow into the parched and dry places of our lives where we thirst for your reassuring presence and your mercy, where we long for new hope and new energy, where we seek for truth, justice, and reconciliation. Let your refreshing waters flow. Let your healing waters flow into places of pain and suffering where we long for your comfort and care. Where there is unresolved conflict and tension, where grief and loss linger, where relationships are damaged and broken, let your healing waters flow. Let your cleansing waters flow into places that are stained and polluted, where we seek your forgiveness for past wrongs and missed opportunities. Where there is a buildup of toxic words and hateful messages, where fear and mistrust cloud our perspectives, let your cleansing waters flow. Let your abundant waters flow into places of scarcity and need, where we long to be filled with your compassion and mercy. Where there are empty reservoirs of energy, where our wells of patience and tolerance are running dry, let your abundant waters flow. Let your turbulent waters flow into places that are stagnant and motionless, where we need a rush of fresh inspiration. Unsettle our complacency and flush out the sludge of old systems that don't work anymore. Where we are frozen with indecision and inertia, let your turbulent waters flow. May the gifts of your spirit flow into us and fill us, and let your life-giving waters flow through us to bless others. Amen. O oh, healing river, Send down your waters, send down your waters upon this land. O oh, healing river, send down your waters and wash the blood from off of the sand. This land is marching. This land is burning, no seed is growing in the barren ground. Oh, healing river, send down your waters. Oh, healing river, send your waters down. Let the sea of freedom awake and flourish let the deep roots nourish let the tall stalks rise O oh, healing river send down your water O oh, healing river from out of the sky
As we come to the close of our worship service today, let us lift our hearts together in prayer. Eternal God, you call us to come to the water. You call us to the waters of creation, of blessing and life. You call us to the waters of redemption, of liberation and justice. And you call us to living water, water gushing up to eternal life. As we take up your call, give us faith and courage to follow where you direct us, knowing that your mighty hand is leading and your steadfast love is supporting us. We pray this through Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>